Okay. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Um, welcome to what is our second webinar of the fall 22 semester. Uh, this one is entitled Open Pedagogy as a Tool for Student Empowerment. Like I said, it's our second in a series of four webinars um, for the fall 22 semester. And we'll talk about the other offerings at the at the end of this webinar. Um, this is hosted by CCC OER, as you probably know, the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources. Um, and these webinars are put together by the Professional Development Committee. Um, my name is Ryan McKinney. I am Director of Theater Arts and the Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning at Kingsborough Community College in Brooklyn, New York, which is part of the City University of New York. Um, I have the wonderful task of putting together today's webinar, and we have three wonderful presentations which we'll be getting to shortly. So I'm going to do a quick overview and then get to the information that you all came here for. So here's our agenda for today. I'm just going to provide a quick overview of uh, CCC OER. And then we have three great presentations, starting with a, an overview of open pedagogy and then going into one professor's um, experience with renewable assignments in global art history courses. And then uh, a presentation on a framework for collaborating and a collaborative design of renewable assignments. And then we'll be talking about some of our upcoming events in CCC OER and OE Global and ways for you to stay in the loop and stay involved with us. So the Community College Consortium, uh, the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources uh, has a mission to expand awareness and access to high quality of open educational resources, to support faculty choice and development, to foster regional OER leadership, and to improve student equity and success. And they do uh, and approach this mission through a lot of offerings that are available to the entire open education community. Um, just personally, I, I first got involved with CCC OER last year, and it's been um, such an incredible resource for me and my open education journey. And I'm really thankful to the colleagues that I've met here and the way that I've been welcomed into uh, this fold and the way that it has really inspired me to keep thinking about ways that I can bring open to my work as, as an educator and as a, as a new director of the uh, Center for Teaching and Learning. So our membership as of 2022, we have 110 members across 36 states. Um, if you or your institution is not a member and you want to become more involved and want to find out about membership, there's a link here and you can also access that through our website. So here are our excellent presenters for today who I am eternally grateful to for joining us and sharing their experiences with us. The first is Professor Karen Cantalosi, who may be a familiar face to some of you if you've been involved with CCC OER. Um, Karen is the program director of, of ARLO, the Regional Leaders of Open Education, a program which I uh, luckily took part in last year and I learned so much from Karen. She's also the network director uh, for open education and open science for Rios and a professor emeritus in biology at Keene State College. Our next presenter is Kristen Cash, Professor Kristen Cash, who's a professor of art history at Montgomery College, Tacoma Park, Silver Spring in Maryland. And then my City University of New York colleague, uh, Professor Stacy Katz, Associate Professor, Open Resources Librarian and STEM Liaison at the Leonard Left Library of Lehman College, which is one of the senior colleges of CUNY. Um, thank you. If I do not see you at the end of this, thank you again for sharing your work with us today. So we're going to start with Karen. Karen's going to give us an overview of open pedagogy to help con contextualize our work today. And then Kristen's going to talk about some of the renewable assignment design that uh, she has done in her art history courses. And then, as we said before, Stacey's going to talk about um, collaborating and uh, a collaborative design approach to renewable assignments. So I'm going to stop sharing and I will toss it over to you, Karen. Um, just so everyone knows, we're going to go through the three presentations and then we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. I'll be monitoring the chat and then we'll have time for questions and discussion when we're done with the presentations. Karen, thanks so much. Great, thank you. Thanks so much, Ryan. Thanks for the introduction. And thank you to everybody who's here today. I really appreciate such a 
big and robust audience. So that's really, really wonderful. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Lately, I've been uh, having fun using this slide to think about uh, shifting paradigms. And there's a lot of different ways that I think about the need for a shift in paradigms within higher education. Um, and uh, one of them is to talk a lot about and I'm not the only one to say, how can we think more about open educational practices and a little less about open educational resources? And that's, you know, that's not to be, you know, a heretic, not, what do you mean, not OER, like, but, but OER, not as the focus, the product, not as the focus. How do we think about people and practices and students and learning? How do we shift this paradigm to think about open educational practices as central to what we do as educators and also central to what I think we need to do in terms of thinking about where higher education is going in its future. What is it that we need to really be thinking about as we think towards uh, changes, especially given the state of our world today? Um, and so when I was asked to give an overview of open pedagogy, it's, it's kind of hard to do. It sort of reminds me of people you know, that you meet and they say, oh, what do you do? And then you start babbling about open education and they say, well, what is that? And so you have to kind of explain it in, you know, a minute or less and it's kind of tricky. Um, but I do like, I like to think about open pedagogy and I'm so glad I have an audience that already knows about what open pedagogy is, right? So it's not starting from scratch, but but I do like to define it for myself because not all of us define it the same way. And so the way that I think about open pedagogy is sort of like these intersection or uh, intersection of these really primary ideas, like the idea for me of collaborating with others, connecting with a community, connecting outside of the classroom beyond just your own your own college, your own classroom, and actually creating community within a classroom and outside of the classroom. I put this up first because I think this is really essential. I think sometimes it can get lost when we're thinking just about how do I make a better assignment as to how am I actually creating community and allowing my students to connect with this broader world as an originating frame for thinking about how I work as a teacher. Um, and then, of course, the idea that we're asking students to create knowledge to and to share that knowledge with others and to be, in in be inclusive in this. Like, what does it mean to inclusively create and share knowledge? How are we bringing a across a broad and diverse range of ideas and perspectives and thoughts to the so-called canons of work that we do? And how do we help our students understand that just slapping an open license on something and sharing it actually has value and that why would they want to do that? I think teaching students why we want to share our work is just as important as teaching them how to do it. So I think that's an incredibly important piece for me as well. Um, and students having agency, I talk a lot about this as well, like what does it mean to provide students with agency, not just to create an assignment for your class, but to help design the course itself, to help write the syllabus with you, to go into the first day and say, let's create the learning outcomes together for this course. You know, what are the policies? Can you make your own attendance policy? And those are some examples. And I say, especially for marginalized students, students that can feel a lack of control, students that haven't had a voice in these educational spaces that we've created for them. How is it that we really help to promote a way of giving students agency? To me, this is part of what I think about when I think about open pedagogy. And that the idea of access is not just to free textbooks or stuff, but the ways that in which we need to think about accessibility broadly, access to food and housing and gas and laptops and captions and safety and along with learning materials and et cetera, because there's so many other kinds of things. And I know that it may be hard to feel like it's your responsibility as an instructor to provide all that. And, and, and it's not, anyone's sole responsibility, but when we collectively think about this as this is part of the job that we have as educators, 
how do I work with my own educational community to think about these things? It broadens my ideas when I'm creating that assignment. It makes me think about what are my students capable of? What can they do? And so for me, open pedagogy sort of encompasses all four of these things. Sometimes I'm thinking about one of these circles more than I'm thinking about the others. But uh, to the extent that this provides kind of an ideal framework for creating open pedagogical practices within your classroom, I think it, it can be a guidepost. And I find it to be a really helpful guidepost for me. Um, I'm just going to give a few little examples because I know we have others that are going to give really great examples today. Um, and I, I lately like to really think about open pedagogy as public service. When students create something and they openly license it and they put it in a place where others can see it and it's shared with the world and it has useful value, like this is a, an example of Carlos Gallier, who is a biology professor at North Carolina State University, and his students that produced um, a lot of material. This is one example. One of the things that they did is they ran this po podcast in his uh, metagenomics class. And so here's the students talking about antimicrobial resistance within the environment. And so other people have the opportunity to learn about that, people outside of the classroom, people within the community. So not only are these students understanding the molecular and genetic basis of what antimicrobial resistance is, they're taking their knowledge, they're making it for the public and they're, and they're sharing it in a way that can be copied and revised and remixed and used by others and serving a community function all at the same time. To me, this is the essence of open pedagogy. A student's creating and um, openly licensing OER. We, we, uh, all of you can think of examples of student created OER and textbooks. But when students can envision the project to begin with, like we'd like to write a book about this and we're gonna write all of these chapters and this is how we're gonna arrange it and, and we're gonna edit it <laughs> and we're gonna choose the license and the title and everything. And then you might think, well, Karen, what did you do as professor? Um, you know, helping to guide students through this process is such a, a wonderful experience as they're thinking and they have so many questions about it along the way. And the fact that students can have this much agency and they're learning so much as they do this, I think is just kind of really a fabulous thing. And the other thing about uh, this project is that it, you know, it spanned over three years where students from different classes and different sections and sometimes people create an assignment and they're like, oh, well, that's done. But actually, it's not right. This is that renewable idea is that your students from the next semester can edit all of that writing. They can add to the chapters. They can. Th this is kind of a never ending thing. And again, for me, it's a reminder that it's about the process not the product. It's, it's not about this book that these students created. It's about the process that each individual that was engaged in this, what they got out of that experience of creation and of collaboration and of sharing and of licensed decision-making, all of those pieces is, is part of what I think is really so fundamental to the value of open pedagogy. And when we think about how open pedagogy in particular is about thinking about our most marginalized students and putting them at the center when we when we give students opportunities to speak for themselves. You know, um, the idea of the self-determination of marginalized people and groups to be able to speak for themselves. Uh, there's, th there's different ways that we can look at examples of this. This is a student who was in a genetics class learning about the genetics of skin color and turning it into thinking about the social construction of race in particular within her, whole, her own family from Thailand. And again, just as an example, just to give you a hint of like, what are things that you might think about could be really valuable for you and your students? Um, and, um, and there's a lot of different tools and platforms under which you can do this. This is uh, I'm talking about domain of one zone, but it's certainly not the only place. Um, and so when I think about open pedagogy and the idea of providing trust and agency and empowerment for students to cooperatively learn, that, th that these kinds of environments actually do a number of things, uh, which is to, whoops, um, maybe messed up my screen share there for a minute, is, is that faculty and staff can actually address student anxiety, isolation, powerlessness, and marginalization. Like just thinking about the ways in which we design for care and allow students to have that kind of environment allows us to leverage open 
to transform educational experiences and, and cultivate these opportunities for creation and, and, and contribution. And so when we've done that, when we created that environment, students then can address political injustices, uh, they can in, address environmental issues, they can share knowledge, they can provide uh, ways in which we can think about addressing economic, environmental, social, cultural, and educational issues. And so open pedagogy in and of itself is part of a way in which we can feel is helping to transform the higher educational system because our students are part of that transformation process um, and can be quite directly. Uh, so for me, um, these are the kinds of, of things I think about with open pedagogy. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there because I don't wanna take up too much time. I know we have a lot of other speakers um, that are gonna give some really fabulous examples and um, happy to, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take questions at the end of everything probably, right, Ryan? I'll turn it back over to Ryan, thanks. Thanks so much, Karen. That's such a, a great um, framework for us to sort of uh, situate our conversation um, for, for today. So now uh, we're going to turn it over to Professor Kristen Cash from Montgomery, Montgomery College, who's going to talk about some renewable assignments and global art history. Thanks so much, Kristen. Thanks, Ryan. You'll hear me okay? Good. And thanks, Karen, for the perfect uh, sort of launch for this conversation. Um, as always, uh, you, you put things so so beautifully um, and succinctly um, in a way that that directly kind of follows uh, the way that I practice open pedagogy. So I, I do want to to reemphasize that point. Um, that really when we talk about open pedagogy, we are talking about a practice. Um, and for those of you that might be new to open pedagogy or the terminology anyway, um, I'm here to reassure you, you're probably doing a lot of this stuff um, already and just maybe not, not calling it open pedagogy. I know for me, um, some of the things I'm gonna be showing you and talking to you about are, are, are things I've been doing for you know, so many years, <laughs> a couple of decades in my, in my teaching practice um, and only recently realized like there's this whole body of thought and, and, and sort of ideas behind why we do open pedagogy and really the, the amazing levels of benefits that it offers for our students and for us as instructors. Uh, the renewable and sustainable works, you know, works for us and it works for them. So um, I'll be coming back to a few things that, that Karen said um, as I show you some examples. So what I'd like to do is um, I wanted to share three different types of renewable assignments that I use in various um, uh, courses that I teach. I do teach art history. Um, I teach it globally uh, and so I have, I mean, you know, five or six classes that I teach. And I've used these assignments in um, specific courses, but these are also renewable in the sense that if it's something that I've developed for a survey course, I can kind of pull parts of it out and apply it to another course. So I'll also talk about the ways, the different ways that we can think about renewable um, in these assignments. Uh, so, and I have Liz driving my slide. So Liz, uh, next slide, please. So um, I wanted to start with this one. This is really kind of the most basic level. Um, it's kind of the easiest one to do in terms of an open pedagogy practice. And this is the open choice uh, discussion or activity. Uh, this is an example that I, I did in my uh, global modernism class in a section on early, uh, early photography where students had to learn about the beginnings, the origins of photography as a medium, some of the early history, and most importantly, in um, my classes, I focus on the relevance of, of art history in real life. So it's always about, you know, what is the power of images? Uh, how are they made? Why are they made? And how do they impact how we see the world around us? And so this assignment comes at the end of the unit. It's called Photography and Me. So right away in the title, it's signaling that this is, this is an opportunity for students to figure out how photography uh, relates to them and their lives and their experience. Um, and basically the assignment, you have the, the detailed prompts up there, but really all it's asking them to do is choose two photographs, one from the early history. Um, I give them some museum collections to go dig through and, and I'm always, just love what they come back with. 
Um, so they're learning some skills and how to, how to navigate museums as well. And then they have to choose from their own collection uh, or on from their phone. And then they're employing the, the foundational skills in art history, which is visual analysis, doing some comparison. And basically they're trying to communicate how looking at a historical photo next to one of their own photos really impacts how they're seeing each of them, right? So that their experience with an object that's very familiar to them, right? The one on the top right is actually my student's actual dental x-ray. He had just gone to the dentist and was like, you know, I was looking at this, this photo by Stieglitz and it was, I know it's somebody's neck, but it made me think of all the different shapes that I saw in my x-ray and I was like, Boom, done, right? That, that is exactly the intention of this kind of assignment is that they're bringing, the student is choosing both the historical artifact that they want to um, look at, something that's quote unquote spoke to them, but then they're also bringing in something from their own experience um, that is very familiar. And this is such a great way for them to connect you know, their lives, their experience, their ideas, and most importantly, their voice to these histories um, and visual histories that are often, you know, seem really far, far removed uh, from their lives. Uh, so this is the kind of assignment you can do really very easily. All it is, it's a scaffolded set of prompts. Um, this one is specific to our historical skills. And then in each step, I am asking the student to bring either the object for discussion or the majority of the content or the discussion. The only thing I'm providing is the scaffold. The rest is totally up to them. And you can see the variety that, that comes out of it. The x-ray, the bottom right is um, my student's grandmother. And then on the left is a photograph of my student and a couple of his best friends next to this amazing Lewis Hine photograph from the 1920s. So. Um, yeah, it's always incredible what they come up with. And that's the point, I think. Next slide, please. OK, so now I want to show you two different sort of larger scale um, open pedagogy assignments. Um, first, I'm going to talk about uh, an assignment that came, a renewable assignment that came out of a fellowship that I did uh, through Montgomery College, which some of you might be familiar with, that's expanding to other institutions. Um, this was through the UN SDG Open Pedagogy Faculty Fellowship, um, where uh, as a cohort, I worked with two colleagues from two different um, community colleges. One was a mathematician, one was a marketing professor. And we had to come up with a multidisciplinary uh, um, renewable assignment that could apply in all of our courses. Um, so I'm gonna talk about this one that, that I did for my survey of African art class, which is what I would call a scaffolded open choice project. This was the culminating project for a course. And then I'm gonna talk about one that is like next, next level in terms of open pedagogy, which is this is actually a renewable assignment that was developed by a student. Uh, where I acted as the mentor and the facilitator as the student developed an assignment for a um, for one of my uh, units in a global art history survey course. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through the steps of this first project. Um, so this is the the sort of scaffolded uh, open pedagogy. Um, uh, final project. It was called Portraits of Power, Women Leaders in African Art. And this was an assignment that extended the entire length of the semester. So each slide I show you is going to be a different step on the scaffold. At every point in, in this project, the student is the one choosing what to do um, and how they present it, right? Sort of that the, it works both in terms of content, but also the flexibility in terms of format and presentation. Next slide, please. So the first step was sort of what are we doing and why are we doing it? Um, and it was quite, you know, again, very open. I asked them in three different ways to reflect on sort of the nature of leadership of women or female leaders in general, and then the power of representation. So these were three separate little mini assignments where the students had to 
think about women in their lives and women leaders in their lives and come up with their list of what are, what are the qualities of leadership. Then we did a little um, research into uh, women leaders in Africa. They had to connect those two. What are some of the qualities that we see in these, these very specific women? And then finally, we looked at the power of representation where students had to go find an example of an artwork or a video or a media product that showed women uh, in a position of leadership and talk about how that visual, represent, re, visual representation impacted how they saw them as leaders. Next, please. Then they had to uh, come up with their own example. So I had this student here who chose Maya Angelou. There was a whole variety. They had to explain how they saw them as a leader and also you know, some examples of their work or their life that communicated those qualities that they believed were of uh, an effective leader. Next, please. Then, this is the art history class, they had to choose a work of contemporary African art. I'm showing you one example here. Um, and I, again, this is one of the a perfect example of how you need to be flexible with these open pedagogy. This is a course in African art. And I had students repeatedly go to the African diaspora, which I was like, great, if this is where they wanna go, let's go. Um, and so here we have an artist who's an Afro-Cuban American artist. Um, and the student had to choose a work that they saw, they felt in some way connected to this idea of female leadership and then um, explain how and why. Next slide, please. Again, tapping in with the foundational skills in art history, they had to do a visual analysis, which was how do we visually see these qualities of leadership in their chosen artwork? And then they had to do some research and get some uh, context, learning a little bit about the artists, a little bit about their culture, and explaining how some of those contexts behind the artwork connect to their conception of leadership in this particular work. Next, please. And then finally, they're called, sort of at the very end, they had to pull it all together. And, and I always ask just a very straightforward, open question. Why did you choose this painting? Why this work? How is this a portrait of power to you? And that's where the student sort of brings it all into this personal connection. How does this work speak to them and their understanding of leadership? Next, please. And here's a few examples. Again, what I love about these open assignments is just the variety. Um, when asked to, to give an example of female leaderships, everything from artists, the show Obama came up a lot. And the most beautiful, like, you know, squishy tear inducing part was like moms, moms all over the place. It was like my, you know, the most incredible woman in my life is my mom. And so giving students that opportunity to really, really connect, you know, what they're learning about art and history um, to their to people that they love and care about and admire um, was really the, the ultimate you know uh, ultimate sign of success with this particular assignment. Next, please. And I just wanted to share. I think we have time. Um, I do have one short uh, testimonial from a student who did this particular project. He um, is Barbadian, and he chose for his example um, the the Prime Minister of Barbados, uh, the Honorable Mia Motley, um, and the artist on the bottom right. And I'm just going to have him speak for himself. If you could play that. Are you seeing the video now? Yes, please. Thanks, Liz. Hello everybody, my name is Jason Small and I'm a current student at the Montgomery College. For my final project in the African art course, which I took at the Montgomery Community College, I completed a PowerPoint presentation that discusses the effective female leaders. I highlighted Barbados' own Prime Minister, the Honorable Mia Motley, and Moroccan artist Botol Shimi. As two women who are active female leaders in our world, the focus of my presentation was on Ms. Shimi and how I consider her a leader because she uses art to elevate the voices of everyday African women. The intended outcome of my project was to really hone in on the idea that everyday normal African women are leaders in their community. They don't necessarily have to be famous or doing something unique, but they are leaders for all that they do for their families and communities throughout their usual days. If you really think about it, 
many African women cook to fuel their families and raise children who will become the future of our society. These responsibilities alone are enough to consider them incredible leaders. Ms. Shimi recognizes this idea and incorporates it into her art so that she can help other people see it too. This assignment was really important to me because it helps me articulate and send a message that we as a society should honor and, rec and recognize the daily contributions of women everywhere. The artwork that Ms. Shimi does can help change the way we as a society think about women so that we don't take women for granted or disrespect them. It is important for me to help expand on this message, especially of what it means to my mom, my sisters, my little niece, and my wife. I also, it's also the message that I want my 10-month-old son, Jaden, to understand when he grows up in this world. Thank you. So yeah, that kind of says it all um, in terms of how, how this thing uh, works and, and connects with students. Um, and I know I'm bumping up on time. Let me go really quickly through the second one. Next slide, please, Liz. Um, the second one, like I said, is a sort of a next level where I was working with a student through our uh, decolonizing the curriculum uh, initiative at Montgomery College, where a student and faculty pair work together on a project um, that would open up uh, uh, the pedagogy and practice to, to students. Um, this student developed two renewable assignments for my survey uh, level course. Next slide, please. Uh, the first one was this one called Countdown, where basically they showed, um, uh, we would show them, uh, the students, a uh, work of art, and then they would respond, look at it for about 30 seconds, and then respond to how they uh, saw, what they saw, what they smelled, what they heard, what they tasted, et cetera. And this was an assignment that um, she came up with through one of her psychology classes that she really found that, that doing this kind of sensory connection was a really good way to, to have students kind of relax and feel grounded. And so we thought, well, let's see if this works with art history. Um, and as you can see, it kind of works on different levels where you can have students just sort of do that first level with just some sensory responses to it. Um, and then we did, I tried, um, I piloted a more advanced option in one of my classes where the students would choose the artwork and then they would do this exercise with other students. Um, and it created some more sort of advanced level um, interactions and responses to the artwork. Uh, next slide. And then the other one she came up with, which I love, is the trading cards. Um, this one is more of a sort of a culminating project. She was like, you know, it'd be kind of fun to do like art history Pokemon. And I was like, yeah, okay, let's do that. Let's try it, right? And, and I think, you know, she came up with that. The student came up with everything, the templates, um, the, the sort of the reasoning, the vision, you know, all of the work that went into it, this it was super fun. All of the student, uh, the work that went into these assignment was developed by the student. And I was the one just sort of guiding the way. We piloted in the class and we tweaked it based on student response. Um, and, you know, now I use both of these in my classes uh, and it's fabulous. And I'm getting a little, you know, collection of, of Pokemon cards that I, I will hopefully at some point, you know, be able to turn into an OER. Um, because they, they are mostly capturing artists and artworks that the students are interested in, not the ones I'm interested in. And that tends to be artists that are more underrepresented um, and these histories that can be really hard to get to and are most certainly not in the textbooks. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there and hand it over to Stacy for some, some how-tos. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um... I'll go ahead once that stops sharing, but there we go. Let's see. Um, but yeah, thank you, like Karen and Kristen. And you know, Kristen, it's so nice to hear from your student and Ryan for organizing and Liz for like manning everything. I mean, there's really like such a village that goes into making this. And um, I'm just so pleased to to talk a little bit more about the the how-to of it. Um, so I'm presenting on a chapter that I co-authored with a colleague, um, really like one of my partners in crime, other half of my brain, who's not here with us today, but my colleague, Jennifer Van Allen, um, who's an education professor. And 
and I have to shout out actually another part of my brain who's in the the room also of um Shauna who Brandel from Kingsboro so just you know we have like a really rich community of folks at CUNY and it's so nice to be also here with everyone and in community right now so I just have to say that before I go into everything but um you know the we titled the chapter evolving into the open and some of that is to emphasize really that this is like open is a verb I've heard a lot of folks in open say that um and really it can get overwhelming when you see all these fantastic projects that look like finished products right but it really is that it's a process and um you know really it's opening a little bit each time and moving towards that idea um so we developed this framework for collaborative design of renewable assignments and really emphasizing that people aren't alone in this this isn't just like you have to go sit on your own and come up with how you're going to do this but there are people either librarians and structural designers other faculty who have been part of things who can also like help with the design of this help think about things um because that's really so important to not be alone in this process um so the other part of it is renewable assignments which exactly like what you've been hearing about already so um, this is actually a book chapter um, that Jennifer and I authored. Oh, and Cheryl already put it in the chat. I had it like all geared up and you're so good to be on top of that. Um, so it's detailed in the book as well. Um, but, you know, there's so many good chapters actually in this book about open pedagogy, about how to get started. So I highly recommend looking at this book for if you're thinking about open pedagogy. Um, so yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful resource um so many good projects in here oh and I didn't mean to click on it sorry about that but you know as Karen and Kristen have talked about like open pedagogy is just changing who creates knowledge and giving pathways to empower students to be the creators um I found this um, table from David Wiley and John Hilton really helpful when we started thinking about open pedagogy and open practices, um, you know, to kind of classify like, what is it that you're assigning? Because you're already giving assignments, right? Everyone has assignments, but is it a disposable assignment where someone creates an artifact and it, you know, lives in the LMS and doesn't go anywhere else? Is it authentic where it has some value beyond supporting the creator's learning? Is it made, you know, constructionist where it's then made public or is it renewable where then the artifact is openly licensed? So that was kind of how they defined it. Um, and obviously there are other elements that go into it, but at its sort of basic, one thing that we found that faculty really appreciate and that Jennifer and I appreciate when we found this kind of decision making and classify classification of assignments was that so much of this, as Kristen said, is stuff that you're doing already, right? Like. Um, my colleague Jennifer, she's a teacher educator, so it gets very confusing when we talk about it because her students are teachers, so it always gets a little bit weird of who's the student and who's the teacher and what level we're talking at, but she's teaching teachers, and her assignment that she was already giving in her course was really already a constructionist assignment, so in her assignment, student, her students, the teachers, were asked to create a lesson plan and incorporate technology into it in her um it's language literacy and educational technology was her course so the artifact the students were creating artifacts the artifact had value beyond their own learning the artifact was made public because they were actually already teaching with it but the artifact was never openly licensed because jennifer didn't know about open licenses at that point so that was a place where it wasn't renewable, but it really was constructionist. Um, you know, it was being displayed elsewhere than just in her courts. It actually made it into, you know, the student's classroom into their school where she was teaching with it. So we were looking at, well, okay, what, what could she do? You know, how could she also, as someone who was teaching an educational technology course, Jennifer felt like, Hey, I should be teaching my students about OER and Creative Commons licensing. I mean, when you talk in teacher education, also like the levels of students that you're impacting really goes all the way down to like our students who are in K to 12 New York City public schools. So there's a lot of levels of teaching happening that then influences the next sort of 
classroom, which is one of my favorite things about working with the education department at my college. So then Jennifer changed her assignment and you can see over here that this was her assignment that she then assigned was um, that actually instead of create your own you know, lesson plan that you're going to share or in your course, we want you to actually adapt or remix an OER resource or create. So it gave students more options because you know Jennifer knew from her own practice as a teacher, oftentimes she wasn't coming with a lesson plan from scratch. Education is about sharing. So she would have a lesson plan from someone else or she would have something that she had worked on previously. So she now gave students that ability, her teachers the ability to say, oh, you know what, actually, I can take something that, you know, from elsewhere, from OER Commons, and I can remix it. And I can think about lesson planning differently than I have before. Um, and then they were required to either upload it to the shared resource collection or to share it on OER Commons. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but you can see students were asked to create new artifacts or re remix existing OER. It had value beyond, and they were invited to openly license, to publicly share it and then openly license it. So when we thought about our process, we kind of came up with this framework, thinking back on how did we get from like where she was to where she wanted to be. Um, so in the first step, we went back to that Wiley and Hilton sort of criteria, and we analyzed and classified her assignment. Her assignment was actually living in that space of constructionist. Um, so then the next step was to consider what would be a meaningful OER contribution within her field. And you could see there are different ways that could happen. But, you know, for Jennifer sharing, you know, in teacher planning, teacher education, lesson plans, other resources are really useful. So that was a meaningful OER contribution. That can really vary depending on the discipline. Um, there are so many good examples and, you know, Kristen and Karen shared good ones already. Um, so I don't wanna, you know, go into it too much. Um, but then we thought about what tools and repositories do we have available to us? So at CUNY, we had things like, we just have Pressbooks now, but we had access to Manifold, but that didn't seem like the right space for these for this assignment. Um, we had the CUNY Academic Commons, which is like a WordPress instance, but that didn't also feel like the right place for it. But OER Commons and teaching how to use an OER repository that teachers could then continue to use in their practice felt like the really a good place for these teachers to deposit what they were creating and to get them familiar with searching in that and using it. Um, and then the idea of student agency. So how are we designing and negotiating for openness was really important to us, that students didn't have to share it openly outside of the class because we said so, that they had choice in that. Um, you know, and Catherine Cronin talks a lot about this, of you know, letting students making those decisions of like, will I share openly? Who will I share with? Who will I share as? And will I share this? And you know, Jennifer and I did research on this assignment as well. And students didn't necessarily share um, outside of the class at first. We only had a few students who chose to share on OER Commons, even though they all shared within the class. And in our later research where we interviewed students, which was finally just accepted for publication, so that'll be coming soon. You know, pandemic research is, is slow to come out, um, but they, felt like this was their professional identity. So they wanted to run the lesson first. So they wanted to make sure it was really good before they shared it outside the class context. But many of them, once they shared it, once they ran the thing, ran the assignment with their students, they were like, oh yeah, I do want to share this actually openly. And that's important to me, but it was their kind of professional reputation also. Um, so some of the examples of the teacher candidate OER that you can see, um, there was a project-based learning unit. These, this was one that was shared on OER Commons. Um, another student created this first grade mathematics um, workbook for the parents, which Jennifer had never seen, um, like a student create something for their parents before. Um, the teacher wanted to you know, help the parents understand the mathematical concepts. So that was what she created, um, which was a really interesting take on this assignment. 
Um, another example that also Jennifer did, because she's my like, you know, person leading this at Lehman, um, and she's just really doing amazing work. She taught a Lehman Scholars course and had students evaluate OER for social justice, where students um, like evaluated, created a rubric for OER for social justice, and then evaluated different OER, and um, that's all in this book. So feel free to check that out on Pressbooks. I've got the link over there, and I can put links in the chat as well. Um, but you know, the, these students actually shared very openly. And yeah, I think that's interesting about like their professional reputation and public contribution. Absolutely, um, Karen, it's, you know, I think it was something a little bit new to them and they didn't feel like they could share necessarily, but then once it went well, they felt like they could. Um, but yeah, I think that also, yeah, is very interesting as a process. Um, of how they think about it and what they think is worthwhile and what, you know, what their confidence is. I mean, some of the recommendations that we have is also like Jennifer's course, the teacher candidate course was, um, is one of the last courses they take. That's the first time they heard about Creative Commons licensing. And in our qualitative interviews, all of them were like, how is this the first time I'm hearing about Creative Commons licensing and OER? Like, how have I not heard about this yet? Um, yes, and there weren't any, there wasn't implementation of peer review in that iteration of it. Um, this is something that, you know, we're iterating the project as well. So that's something that we're talking about putting in to it um, as part of the process. But, you know, sometimes that, that timing, the first time you run an assignment, you don't know how much time everything's going to take. So, I think that'll be in the future. That was also a recommendation we had. But yeah, teaching students also about OER and Creative Commons licensing earlier in their sequence, especially because these are these are actual New York City teachers. They're getting a, a, a degree in um, literacy, um, literacy education, literacy studies. So these are people who are working teachers and they had never heard of it, had no idea what Creative Commons licensing or OER were before this course. So um, some of the research and related resources that you can take a look at. Um, we have an article on this, on the actual assignment in open praxis. Um, we presented at OE Global on some of our studies, study findings. Um, and then also just a, um, a really good starter kit workbook that I'm partial to with, um, with Abby Elder that we worked on if you're looking to get started with all these things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, I actually do also curate a list of OER publications at CUNY, which I can put that link in the chat because, I mean, I think that's one of the things of the community of OER folks are so generous that this really should be collaborative work. This doesn't have to be something that people do in silos because so many of us are working on this and happy to think it through. And I think that some of it is also like, you know, Karen, what you're saying about like, how do we get students to like take that risk sort of in their in their professional lives? Like we also have to think about how we're taking risks as faculty and how we're putting ourselves out there and modeling that kind of like, hey, I'm gonna try this and it may not work, but you know, I'm taking that little step and I'm trying something out and getting messy a little bit. So, and then there's some of the references if you want to check out any of these resources as well. Um, but, you know, I think probably there are questions, so I should stop talking so we can get to those. And I'll share some more links in the chat as well. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you so much. Um, and again, Karen, Kristen, Stacey, thank you so much for these, these wonderful and like very, um, like my my brain is just sort of like going a thousand miles a, a minute trying to think about ways that I can incorporate all this great stuff into my own my own courses. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Oh, Ryan, I totally forgot to plug my presentation on upcoming oh, journal, which you had said I could do, and I I totally forgot. So while you're getting ready to share, I'll just say um, I do have um, a presentation on and a journal um, special issue that's coming up that I forgot to mention which is not about renewable assignments exactly, but it's on the intersections of open educational practices and equity pedagogy. 
And if you're going to open ed, we have a panel um, on Wednesday at 4.30. Um, Una is going to be on it. I think it's okay to tease that, um, talking about the open for anti-racism. And some of the publications for the journal are starting to get posted in the early site as well. So um, on the journal website, you can check those out. So please join us to hear from really the authors who um, wrote these fantastic articles um, and talking about really how we infuse equity within these open educational practices, because it's not a given that it would be there, even though you would hope that it's something we have to intentionally design for. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, like Una said in the chat, the slides and the recording will be made available. So if you want any of the resources that were in the presentations, they'll be available through the slides um, later on. But um, you know, we have a few minutes left. I'd love to open it to questions that you can either unmute yourself or if you want to just place them into the chat, we'll probably have time for a couple of them um, before we have to wrap up because I want to be conscious of everyone's time. Um, any questions? Kristen, there was one question earlier and then Michelle, I'm gonna come to you. Um, in the chat of if you can speak to how you see your assignments as being renewable in terms of how they might not be disposable or how they sort of feed back into the class or might be public facing or available to students in future semesters, any any way that you see the that with the work in, in your assignments. Yeah, um, I, I think I saw that in the chat and it, it's actually the next step that I'm working on um, because one of the things I, I started to realize as I was being more intentional about um, incorporating the renewable side of things into my assignments is in my field in art history, there just aren't any resources um, in, in the vast majority of kind of global history of art and so I've really been struggling with honestly with how to how to best do that um, and I my hope is 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 basically what I've, I've been at MC for three years um, I've been doing these assignments for about two and so I now have a really nice collection of artworks artists and sources that are all student generated. Um, and so I'm, I'm definitely looking into, you know, press books kind of OER more classic kind of way, but I'm also thinking about how, um, how I might make these uh, assignments and um, the work that the students our students are doing more public, especially in teacher training. I think teacher training is such an, an important area that that this work can really reach out into. Um, and I, in particular, my area, we work with visual literacy and media literacy. And so, you know, one of the, I'm very honest with with students about these assignments and saying, you know, you are helping to generate resources that do not exist. Um, and, and so the next step for me is to figure out exactly what to do with that, um, with all of this information that I'm gathering. Um, but yeah, next, next step, stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> but they are just, they are renewable in the sense that I, I renew, I, they are used in different courses. And then I actually also have, some of these are on something like Padlet, where students are creating kind of an ongoing metastasizing virtual gallery, for example, where they can see what other students have done. And one of the rules is you can't choose a work that another student has chosen. So that's one way that, that I'm already practicing to kind of have students see what other students are doing. Yeah, that's great. Um, and in theater, we have, we have many of the same challenges that you just articulated, Kristen, so that really resonates with me. Um, Michelle, did you still have a question? Yeah, just really quickly. I know yeah, uh, um, <clears throat> I know on the um, com conversations, I know with the University of System of Maryland, we've been talking about um, OER and such. There, there gets to be a point also where students have to be given that uh, honesty of saying, okay, we are using OER, but there's also this, this um, recognition that a student is building, um, you know, building this area of um, producing knowledge. And when we're doing that with other students, there, there still is this conversation going back and forth. At what point 
is this student feeling um, <clears throat> that they're being taken advantage of? You know what I'm saying? Um, and and I and I haven't he heard a really clear answer. I know we're using OER and it's open resources, but we're also talking about a student at, at that level moving into some high level uh, production of knowledge. And there's almost this <clears throat> this this feeling of taking advantage of that student's information to go in there. And, and and like I said, I haven't really heard answers to that yet. We're starting those conversations. And I just didn't know if any of the panelists had a thought. And I know our time is very close. So I, I certainly understand and can take it off online, uh, offline. Thanks for that really, really important question, Michelle. Karen, I'm going to try and maybe put you on the spot a little bit because I feel like that was a big thing of what we talked about in Arlo last winter um, in terms of sort of, you know, how do we bring students in and how do we credit them accordingly for their contributions to the knowledge commons? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. There's a, there's so many pieces going on here. And, um, and just to, to say that referencing back to the uh, point of, that I was making in the chat when Stacy was talking, which is fascinating. I can't wait to read your study. Like students were hesitant to share, which makes sense given the structures that we have and the ways in which we as faculty feel hesitant to share, like the whole system is set up to be very competitive. And so, um, you know, how is it that we get students to feel comfortable putting licenses on and sharing work? Uh, you know, there, there's no easy answer to that. You know, when you're talking about how do we shift the entire structure and the world, how do we make students feel comfortable? How we, you know, I think the, the tiny things that we do to begin with is creating, you know, a, a comfortable atmosphere within our classrooms, which I think all of these folks that we're today talking about, right, Kristen and Stacy, certainly doing that and talking about that. Um, but but what can one educator do in a school where they know you're going to send you know you're going to send your students out into this competitive world and you don't want them to not look good, right? So it's it's super challenging. I, I don't I don't really have the answers to that. I feel like the more that we can value uh, the collaboration. Uh, over the competition, the more that we can create ways to do that, the more we can stop sort of get towards this. And I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, Ryan, <laughs> but I think that's kind of what's been on my mind a lot when I think about shifting structures, like the systemic competitive atmosphere that we're in, which makes it really, really difficult to, to do the kind of contributory work that we talk about. Thanks, Karen. And I think what you're you know, I think what you're highlighting is sort of all of the, the multiple considerations in this question. Um, and that there, you know, one of the reasons I think Michelle is raising it is, is there isn't a tidy answer, right? Maybe we haven't found that yet, but I'm, I'm earmarking this mentally for us to sort of think about maybe a session just on this for the spring, for the spring webinars, because I think it is certainly worthy of an hour of time and we could certainly talk about it for that amount of time. Um, but we are at four o'clock. I want to just make a couple of announcements before we all go on with our days. Um, Stacy, Kristen, and Karen, thank you once again. Thank you to Luna and Liz for their leadership and their organization, as well as our VP of Professional uh, uh, Development, Shinta Hernandez, who has been such a great resource for me as I have joined the Professional Development Committee. So these are our webinars for our remaining webinars, right? Today, uh, we had Open Pedagogy as a Tool for Student Empowerment. November 9th, we have Open Ed as Enabler for Anti-Racism and Social Justice. And then December 7th, Measuring the Impact of Open Education. And uh, those will all be sent out on the listserv and the information on them on our website as well. Um, please stay in the loop. There's some upcoming open education conferences that are listed on our website under the Get Involved menu. Um, please join our community email. It's very active. It is such a great resource. So please join if you haven't already. And read our EPI blog posts and student OER impact stories on cccoer.org. <clears throat> and then lastly, please, if you get a chance and you see our slides, please fill out our survey. It helps us know, you know, um, how helpful this webinar was. If you want to hear more about this topic and um, 
you know, what we can do to continue to serve our membership. So um, thank you so much. Uh, it was a real pleasure to hear um, about uh, these assignments and the way that we are all trying to bring uh, open pedagogy to our work. And um, everyone have a great day and a great semester. See you all soon.